Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all of you, and welcome to the Global Center's Roundtable uh, discussion on the future of multilateralism, opportunities and challenges in counterterrorism efforts. My name is Ilko Kessels, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Center on Cooperative Security. Today marks the opening of the general debate of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. Now, of course, this would typically be the time of year when many of us would gather in person in New York at the United Nations, at side events and over coffees, enjoying either the cooling effect of the onset of fall or the last humid remainders of a very late summer. But not this year. Instead, today, ANGA continues the virtual format at the United Nations and so many of us have turned to to conduct our business. But although the format has changed, the challenges facing multilateral institutions and multilateralism more generally have not. They are in fact more complex than ever. The Global Center's Roundtable series provides a platform uh, to explore key issues and developments in the counterterrorism landscape and consider their human rights and rule of law implications by bringing together perspectives from the United Nations, member states, civil society, and the private sector. And while I'm not sure we can reach the level of informal interactions and problem solving that normally takes place during, annual, during our annual ANGA reception, and while I look forward to the day that we can all be safely in the same room together, I'm certain this discussion our, let's say, official, unofficial ANGA side event will give us plenty to reflect on and reconnect on in the coming weeks. During this ANGA, the Global Center is dedicating our efforts this year to the role of civil society in addressing the root causes of violent extremism. Throughout this month, on our website and social media accounts, we will share relevant publications, programming, and other outputs that demonstrate our own and our partners' impact working on these issues around the world. Please follow along as we highlight the many ways civil society contribute to counterterrorism efforts and explore how governments and multilateral bodies can improve their engagement with civil society using the hashtag civil society inclusion. It is good to see so many of you here. You will hopefully now see pop up on your screen a poll uh, which allows us to give you a better sense of who is joining us, who is with us here today. So please complete the poll which is anonymous that will have popped up on your screens. I'm very grateful uh, for the participation that we continue to see increase uh, across our uh, various meetings that we've organized over the last uh, number of months virtually. And it's been great to reconnect and connect with so many of our friends uh, and partners uh, across the world. I will update you on the poll results uh, when they come in. The topic of today's events is inspired by the banner of the United Nations 75th anniversary, the future we want, the UN we need, reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. And implied in the statement and the declaration that was adopted yesterday is both the recognition of the need for, but also the precarious state of multilateralism. The world is facing a global downturn of democratic values and rising authoritarianism, a worsening climate crisis, and rising inequalities and gender disparities, as for instance evidenced by the fact that we need to wait a full day and a half to have the first female head of state deliver remarks at the UN's general debate. The health pandemic has further worsened conflict dynamics and resource deficits, has led states to normalize emergency measures and implement heavy-handed responses, harming those who are already considered the most vulnerable. In short, the world is facing a range of highly complex, interconnected, destabilizing challenges that cannot be solved unilaterally. And this is all the truer for the field of counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism, where consensus on the counterterrorism agenda seems to be on increasingly thin ice, and where national priorities and growing mistrust among member states lead to questions around the added value of multilateral counterterrorism cooperation. At the same time, we see that parts of the UN's counterterrorism architecture have seen significant growth over the last years. And of course, the UN is, one but, um, uh, is but one of the many multilateral and regional entities that are engaged in efforts to stem terrorism and violent extremism. And at the national level, responses to violent extremism are increasingly politicized, increasingly repressive in nature, and are state rather than human-centric in their approach. So while all terrorism is local, this cross-border phenomenon requires a principled multilateral response to set norms, to build capacity, to allow for cooperation and coordination among a diverse set of partners, to tackle its underlying drivers, and to ultimately safeguard human security and human development. We hope that today's discussion will allow participants to share their perspectives and reflect on opportunities and challenges in multilateral counterterrorism efforts. And to do that, we will start off with four excellent panelists 
uh, who will provide uh, brief remarks before turning to shortlisted interventions and finally opening the conversation up for all of you to join. Before we go into today's roundtable, a few housekeeping rules to ensure a smooth event. Firstly, today's roundtable is being live streamed and recorded via YouTube. Secondly, we invite you to raise any questions for our panelists using the Q&A function, and we'll address as many of these as time allows. And you will find the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And thirdly, if you have any technical concerns during our event, please send a message through the chat function to the panelists, uh, and my colleague Adele Westerhuis will respond as soon as possible. Thanks for your assistance, Adele. Now, I just got some of the poll results back, uh, and here uh, I'll, I'll share those with you um, um, in percentages. So we have a, a very even divide between about 27% uh, of government representatives, 30% of civil society organizations, 26% of multilateral organization representatives, and then 60%, one six uh, of people um, that recognize uh, themselves as falling under the other category, so private sector, um, independent researcher, et cetera. And then in terms of the uh, regional representation, uh, the results are slightly more skewed. Uh, about 45% of people are calling in from Europe. Um, we have 25% of people uh, joining us from, from North America, about 11% uh, joining from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and the remainder uh, made up of about 5% each from Central and South Asia, East and Southeast Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, North Africa uh, and Western Asia. So. Uh, quite a broad spread there as well. Again, thank you all for joining us. I think this shows uh, the benefit of organizing uh, these meetings virtually rather than uh, in person, um, and we appreciate uh, your participation in this in this short little poll. I now have the pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Eric Rosand. Eric is the director of the Prevention Project, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and senior associate fellow uh, at the Royal United Services Institute in London. He spent nearly two decades working on counterterrorism issues, and you can read his uh, and as well as other colleagues' bios uh, in the bio page that was uh, shared with all participants. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, uh, Elko, and thanks everyone for joining uh, from around the world for this for this important event. And I, I thought I would offer some brief remarks um, uh, highlighting um, a few trends and gaps I see in this space, recognizing that um, uh, some of this will be familiar to, to some, of, some of those online and, and some of this will be, will be new. I think the first, the first trend worth, worth uh, noting, and Elka, you alluded to this, is sort of the enduring but evolving nature of the threat that multilateral institutions are now uh, having to confront when it comes to terrorism. And despite progress in taking terrorists off the battlefield and killing terrorist leaders and loss of territory, we know the threat is, is more global, local, and interconnected than ever. And low-cost, lone-actor lone attacks, often focusing on soft targets, are increasing, and terrorist groups continue to use social media to recruit and radicalize. And many of these threats are locally rooted. Um, terrorist recruiters are exploiting um, grievances of political, social, economic nature, grievances which have too often been ignored in counterterrorism conversations. And we also know that many of these grievances, many of the conditions that terrorists rely on to recruit are also driving other forms of violence, whether it's um, conflict, political instability, et cetera. Um, the second trend, I think, is uh, the increasing relevance of local actors in this space, from cities to civil society, and the relevance of locally led non-kinetic solutions. In fact, some of the most important lessons over the past 19 years are that first military operations in isolation will not end terrorist movements and that a robust set of non-kinetic uh, tools are needed as well, that national governments can't do this alone. Uh, many solutions will instead lie with local actors, including civil society, local governments, uh, and local practitioners, whether health, social, youth workers, teachers, et cetera. They need to be empowered, supported, and listened to. And many of these locally-led approaches should be integrated into wider efforts to address these other forms of violence and conflict and to address, address fragility. This will lead to more local ownership, more cost-effectiveness, and more sustainability. And finally, and Elka, you alluded to this, uh, the most effective strategies for dealing with terrorism and violent extremism are gonna be ones that are avoiding backlash and backsliding and other unintended consequences and protect human rights. 
The third trend is this increasing attention to multilaterals, counterterrorism, and countering violent extremism cooperation that Elko alluded to. Um, although there were limited advances on the multilateral front during much of the first decade after 9-11, due in part to the gaps in the architecture itself, as well as fallout from the Iraq war, um, the, uh, the operations in, in, in Guantanamo, um, things did begin, begin to pick up in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, part of this was the increased recognition of the comparative, comparative advantages of multilateral institutions here, whether it's forging consensus among governments on strategies and frameworks, whether it's norm setting and standard setting to guide national and local efforts, or whether it's delivering training and capacity building to help countries build their capacities or mobilizing resources um, uh, to support these efforts. And a changed landscape is most noticeable in the multilateral space um, at the United Nations, um, which for much of the first decade was of, of nine, after 9-11 was underperforming, in part because of a lingering sense that terrorism was a Western imposed agenda. Obviously towards the, to, uh, in the second half of uh, the second decade of the 20th century, 21st century, that's changed. And so today counterterrorism is a top priority at the UN, perhaps too much so. Uh, obviously you have the UN Office of Counterterrorism, the UN Counterterrorism Compact, uh, a variety of UN entities developing guidance, recommendations and other publications across a range of issues huge donor support for UN-led uh, counterterrorism efforts, um, uh, albeit mainly uh, driven by two, two donors. Uh, at the Security Council, you have an ever-increasing number of, of resolutions on counterterrorism uh, with additional reporting requirements and new mandates for already overtaxed UN bodies, uh, leading many to question whether um, uh, counterterrorism is, is sort of taking on an outsized priority um, uh, uh, at, at, at the UN. But alongside the UN, many other multilateral bodies have also intensified their uh, in engagements on counterterrorism and CVE. Uh, numerous organizations, regional organizations on virtually every continent have developed new strategic frameworks, action plans, they do capacity building, they facilitate practitioner networking, they mobilize political will. Uh, in addition, international development institutions are in the space now with the OECD and World Bank which had historically been reluctant to associate, again, with what many viewed as a Western imposed security agenda, they're all of a sudden now very engaged because they're increasingly aware of how extremism and other forms of violent conflict can undermine development gains. But beyond these existing institutions taking on more of a counterterrorism mandate, there are new multilateral uh, bodies, platforms, initiatives in this space. Obviously, there's the Global Counterterrorism Forum from 2011, which in many respects helped catalyze a lot of this practical uh, activity. But beyond that, you now have the 82-member Defeat ISIS Coalition with its four working groups and various implementation platforms. And now it's looking to expand its geographic focus beyond Syria and Iraq into uh, regions like the Sahel. Last year, the U.S. spearheaded the launch of an 80-country coalition with a series of working groups to address Hezbollah and other Iranian-sponsored terrorist activities. Other new uh, additions to the architecture include the EGAD Center of Excellence on CVE, the permanent G5 Sahel Secretariat, or thematic uh, platforms such as Etidal in, in Riyadh or the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism. And then you have new initiatives targeting specific stakeholders, such as the Strong Cities Network, the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, the Resolve Network, or YouthCAN. And as a result of these developments, the architecture is more elaborate, more dynamic than ever. There's no shortage of opportunities for policymakers and practitioners to discuss and share experiences and expertise. There are networks connecting women, youth, researchers, and other civil society actors. There's a plethora of guides, tools, programs, workshops, resolutions galore. Uh, now there's a, probably a webinar every week organized by some uh, multilateral organization on some aspect of counterterrorism or countering violent extremism. However, this expansion uh, appears to have been driven as much by short-term political considerations as it has by any coherent strategy that prioritizes the need to leverage existing resources, the existing architecture, and comparative advantages. This has resulted in a plethora of new bodies and initiatives competing for attention from policymakers and practitioners and funding support from different donors, and a clear division of labor remains elusive. Again, the, the preference has been to roll out new platforms 
whether it's at the regional, local, or global level, designed to address a subset of the threat rather than to look at this problem strategically. There are now multiple high-level counterterrorism initiatives with expert working groups underway. Competition is therefore intensified for both the attention of foreign and other ministers and for the limited time of practitioners from many of the same countries. This seemingly uncontrolled growth has led not only to an ever more cluttered um, uh, multilateral CT CVE space, but to an ever increasing number of activities and program, programs angling for limited resources. But perhaps most worrisome, and Elko alluded to this as well, is that this growth, particularly in the last uh, three or four years, comes at a time when the divide among governments and how best to address the threat and how, what issues to prioritize is growing. And in fact, those favoring more security-oriented, more state-driven approaches are having increased influence. So the, the more that this trend continues, the more the architecture is going to sort of be influenced by that, that group of states. And so what are the gaps, the, 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 the gaps in this, in this area? And I'll, I'll, highlight, I'll highlight, highlight three where I think attention can focus um, uh, as we're considering how to uh, strengthen multilateral uh, CT, CVE cooperation and the architecture uh, in this area. The first is the need to connect the global and national effort to the local effort. And I think um, while the playing field is littered with, again, all sorts of different new bodies, platforms, and networks, they're for the most part dominated by national governments, um, principally with representatives from the foreign ministries or interior ministries. Opportunities for non-government or subnational actors to participate in these global platforms in a meaningful, let alone sustained way, are, are few and far between. They have little to no influence on an agenda that is ultimately about, often about uh, them in terms of their role in implementation and, and them being beneficiaries. And again, this is despite the increasingly important uh, um, place they have in the, uh, in the panoply of uh, CT and CVE actors. Few of any of the global platforms uh, including the UN, prioritize promoting collaboration and cooperation between national and local or government and non-government actors. Um, and this is uh, in, in a context where this kind of collaboration and cooperation is often a barrier, the lack of it is often a barrier to translating different global counterterrorism resolutions or frameworks um, into local action. And so I think an increased focus on this uh, so-called vertical co cooperation would help ensure the perspectives of CSOs and local frontline practitioners are more systematically integrated into regional and global CT um, and PVE conversations. The second gap, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll conclude very, very soon, is, is the need to engage frontline uh, non-law enforcement practitioners in these global conversations. Um, again, lots of progress in the last uh, decade in, in bringing uh, practitioners to the table in these conversations, but it's often criminal justice, law enforcement, border security practitioners, um, less so uh, with social workers, mental health professionals, teachers, peace builders, and other development actors. There simply is not a space for this kind of practitioner, um, these types of practitioners to engage in these global conversations, except as a one-off guest speaker uh, at a conference. Um, there's really no space, um, this is the third gap, there's really no space for government and non-government actors to discuss progress uh, in and challenges to implementing the global CVE agenda. Yes, there are plenty of uh, CVE and PVE programs around the world. There are plenty of organizations working in this space, but there's no opportunity that I'm aware of for progress on this agenda, not on counterterrorism, but on preventing violent extremism ever to be discussed among governments and other stakeholders. Uh, that includes development and peace building actors and security and uh, traditional counterterrorism stakeholders. Um, there's no opportunity to talk about what's driving violent extremism. There's no opportunity to talk about um, inter interconnections between um, violent extremism and other forms of conflict and the best uh, ways of addressing those inter in uh, integrated uh, challenges. And I'll just conclude with one, one, one final observation, which is um, that uh, we all recognize that while many of the drivers of conflict, extremists, uh, and other violence and fragility are often the same, the siloed multilateral system inhibits, inhibits the ability to develop the kind of integrated approach to addressing them that most experts believe is required. What ultimately happens is that local communities get saturated with a series of narrowly framed short-term projects focused on achieving limited objectives. 
And so I would argue that if we're looking to the third decade after 9-11, I think one of the one of the key challenges is whether the international community can come together and think about how to develop some kind of platform to allow for regular multi-stakeholder discussions around these interrelated agendas, whether it's PVE, SDG 16, uh, women, peace and security, youth, peace and security. I mean, it's an alphabet soup of agendas that need uh, a common home. Uh, and I would offer that as uh, sort of a, a food for thought for this gathering today, but also for, for uh, the coming years. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eric, for that overview of, of both the good and the bad, but also some, some very clear recommendations on, on how to take this forward. And I, I particularly appreciated the emphasis on both breaking the silo in which counterterrorism and, and counterviolent extremism has developed in a lot of these, these organizations and institutions, often mimicking what has happened at the, at the national level. Um, and connecting with development actors um, and a range of other uh, different different fields of work, but also at the same time uh, appreciating the various uh, uh, levels and layers that are in, in play, all the way from the, the international multilateral level to, to the local uh, practitioner, um, uh, uh, community, uh, police officer, um, uh, and, and municipality uh, worker. And, and all of this is, needs to be interconnected, uh, all of this um, uh, information, the insights that are um, seen at the local level somehow need to translate into what happens at the international level and, and vice versa. So uh, it is no small task, uh, uh, but there are, are plenty of opportunities. And as you write, we said plenty of resources going around uh, to um, uh, ensure that we're uh, improving uh, what we're doing in this space. I'm going to turn next uh, to uh, our, our next speaker, uh, Leila Bokhari. A uh, former deputy minister with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and former state secretary at the office of the Norwegian Prime Minister. And Leila, of course, as many of you know, has extensive experience working uh, for the United Nations and a range of other uh, multilateral and regional organizations. Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elko, and uh, very good morning, or rather good afternoon to all of you from, um, from Oslo, from Norway. Um, colleagues, friends, uh, it really is a pleasure to, to be here and to, to speak to you all. Um, great to see the panelists. Uh, I know there are many more familiar faces around uh, in the room, in this room. Um, however much I wanted us all to, to be in the same physical room for a real exchange of ideas and thoughts, I'm really grateful to the Centre for uh, giving us the opportunity to meet in this virtual event. Thank you also to the Global Centre for putting this topic on the agenda, challenging us to reflect precisely on the role of multilateralism in preventing violent extremism and countering terrorism. As many of you know, and as, as Elko uh, also said, I follow the field of counterterrorism, CVE, PVE, and the developments there for the last two decades now, um, nearly 20 years. And I would like to reflect um, in the beginning just a bit on the landscape that I see emerging. Um, for many of us, I'm sure in the panel, uh, we've been part of this and part of this development or are part of this development. Um, Firstly, it is, and Eric mentioned this as well, an increasingly crowded and complex landscape that has emerged, both in terms of counterterrorism infrastructure or architecture, and in terms of the actors involved. And by actors, I mean both in terms of the perpetrators and the responders. Perpetrators, new actors emerge and learn from each other in terms of tactics, in terms of space. And this challenges us as preventers and responders. In spite of efforts to, and continuous efforts to coordinate, to cooperate and streamline, we see, we see a complexity that may be in some ways needed for the very complexity of the CT landscape itself. But we, um, we also see the various counter entities that have mushroomed, international, regional, local, with all different mandates, some, sometimes overlapping mandates. New actors have evolved challenging the old, but the real question is, of course, do they answer to the challenges that we see on the ground? Do they create a greater bureaucracy of counterterrorism? And importantly, do they create a greater divide or distance between the actual events on the ground and the platforms uh, where counter countermeasures are discussed um, and designed. Secondly, I will, um, I will, however, argue that we have seen a greater understanding 
of the complexity. We've seen development of a better understanding of the complexity of the very fabric of CT, P, PVE and CVE. We have developed a more sophisticated understanding of the whole of society approach, who needs to be there, um, who is part, a natural part of the whole of society approach. Today, countermeasures uh, cover importantly and understandably a whole spectrum of measures from the very the more targeted hard measures to the wider, more societal approaches. This requires that we as society, as policymakers, need to even more carefully design countermeasures. Cooperation needs to be broader, more flexible, more creative, if you like, while at the same time more professional, even more pointed and more insightful. We need arenas where these measures can be safely brought forward and discussed. This brings me uh, to the actors in both the prevention work and in the countering work. There's long been an uh, increasing understanding that government actors cannot do this job alone. Eric was and, uh, mentioned this point as well. Private sector needs to partner with the public sector. Civil society needs to be brought, uh, brought on board. Women, youth, elders must be brought in as important stakeholders, both as they may hold the solutions themselves, but also as important ambassadors for change and real long lasting implementation and effect on the ground. International organizations, regional organizations and non-governmental organizations all play a role with different mandates. Um, on the one hand, we see a realization of this with these actors stepping up to the challenge, yet at the same time we see a, an increasingly shrinking space for, the important, for these important civil society actors. We must also be wary of counter-terrorism uh, becoming a polarizing political frame um, and that too many human rights defenders are both victims of, uh, of, um, uh, both victims of terrorism and the measures that we, that we try to put in place. Multilateralism can be an important guarantor and countermeasure to counter this development. Now we see an undermined um, confidence in the ability of multilateral responses to build capacity and tackle its underlying causes, while at the same time, multilateralism arguably matters more than ever. We need stronger partnerships between the public sector and the private sector, governments and civil society, headquarters and the field. We still need arenas where experiences and lessons are exchanged, continually exchanged and where, and where experiences are shared. We need safe spaces, safe arenas where meetings can be held to develop even better strategies, updated strategies, revisited strategies. And we need multilateralism for the convening power in itself, but also for the agenda setting. And in a landscape where counter-terrorism often becomes, um, as mentioned, a polarizing political frame, we need arenas, arenas where standards are set. I end with the notion that stronger partnership must be developed, forged between governments and civil society, public and private sector, and between different actors in the field of counter-terrorism efforts. Thank you. Leila, thank thank you so much for for those those reflections, and it's uh, it, it's clear to see and to hear um, that you speak from that both from a policy perspective, but also understanding these larger multilateral institutions and understanding uh, from your research background of what it what it looks like um, on on the ground. And we need uh, that multidisciplinary, multi actor approach uh, in this space. Uh, and we need to listen uh, to to folks with those various different backgrounds to really. Um, uh, understand how we can best best prevent and, and respond. Uh, just a quick note to say that the Q&A, as I mentioned, is open uh, throughout um, uh, the panelists' remarks, so feel free to uh, start uh, uh, including your questions. Again, we will gather those and uh, we'll hope to uh, address at least some of them uh, towards uh, the end of, of this discussion, so don't, don't shy away and wait until uh, the very end to share uh, your question uh, with us. I'm now going to turn to our third uh, speaker, um, Amina Razul, who is the president of the Philippine Center for Islamic Democracy, uh, a member of the uh, Board of Regents of Mindanao State University, and one of the three Philippine resource persons for the ASEAN uh, Women for Peace Registry in 2018. Amina, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, 
first, I think I should tell you a little bit about the ASEAN Women for Peace Registry. Um, the OPER, or the ASEAN Women for Peace Registry, was launched by ASEAN um, December 2018 uh, in the Philippines, in Cebu City. And um, it is lodged, it's supported by the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, which aims to strengthen research activities on peace, conflict management, and conflict resolution. The OPER is a means for ASEAN to take stock of its women experts in peace processes, in mediation, in conflict resolution, and to pool the expertise and support of uh, these resources for purposes of uh, ASEAN governments and, and bodies. The OPER also aims to contribute to the implementation of the joint statement on promoting women, peace, and security in ASEAN, which was adopted by our leaders in November 2017 during the 31st uh, summit. So now, I told you a little bit about this um, OPER, this registry, which is at its uh, infancy. Um, I thought I'd start with a positive before I go to my pressing concerns. It seems to many of us who have been watching the world uh, while incarcerated in our homes, that multilateralism has been under attack, particularly this last decade. For instance, we watched with dismay the problems that have befallen the World Health Organization at the worst possible time. We need, at this time, we need multilateralism and our multilateral organizations to be strong, not weak. But there are so many areas, so many uh, points of attack that affect the strength of multilateralism. And there are three areas that worry me, which I feel have diminished the strength of multilateralism and the multilateral organizations and their capacity to preserve peace, to counter and prevent violent extremism. First, and this was uh, mentioned by, um, by uh, Eric uh, earlier, first we have the leaders who have risen with uh, who have an authoritarian bent, keen on promoting populist agenda at the expense of global concerns, such as human rights. I really don't think I need to expound much on this, but what I do wonder is how it became so easy for communities, for citizens to accept authoritarian or uh, you know, authoritarian leaders who are able to manipulate the situation and narrow the democratic space. Second, and this is related, I think, to the rise of um, uh, authoritarian-like uh, leaders. Second, I worry about the growth and expansion of social media, uh, social media giants into areas which if they were with the military, would actually fall under psychological operations or psychological warfare. The way such companies manipulate netizens have pushed us down a path that narrows the democratic space and thus widening the cracks that are exploited by extremist groups of all persuasions, of all colors. Fake news abound and are used to justify this or that agenda. It is not just the misuse of social media and the internet by terrorists and extremist groups that should concern us. Even more pressing is the need to protect freedom of expression, counter hate speech and xenophobia, and the manipulation of individual netizens for narrow political interests. Netizens from teenagers to senior citizens are becoming isolated and therefore prey to such interests. Third, and this is also influenced by the first two, multilateral organizations seem to have lost out on global support, not just because of the rise of authoritarian leaders with populist concerns, 
but also because of an increasing concern of peoples of the world that these organizations have failed to deliver. How much of this is due to social media attacks against uh, international organizations uh, that has to be determined. The rhetoric of leaders who have chosen to focus on their own agenda has increased the dissatisfaction of communities even more with, multi uh, with multilaterals and often with no basis. And this is thanks to fake news and truth decay. The UN General Assembly has just adopted the declaration on the commemoration of the 75th anniversary for strengthening, for strengthening mechanism to combat terrorism, reform multilateralism, inclusive development, and better preparedness to deal with the challenges like COVID, uh, like the COVID pandemic. And I wonder how this will be accomplished, how we can strengthen multilateralism and the organizations, given the concerns that worry me every night. Some would argue that it might be better, it might be a good idea if we sought to strengthen regional organizations or cooperation with regional organizations such as ASEAN for more direct impact on communities. For instance, the UN has a regular forum with ASEAN, the AURED or the ASEAN UN Regional uh, Dialogue. The 2018 AURED highlighted women, peace, and security. Last year's dialogue focused on support for the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. These dialogues had really good recommendations, which would have had impactful uh, change on uh, not just on the ASEAN institution itself, but on the communities, particularly since the ASEAN has been fully supportive of the Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, which is the home of um, the Women for Peace Registry. The OPER uh, in ASEAN is an, um, shall we say, an initiative that has allowed us to slowly but surely, which is the ASEAN way, to permeate the halls of some of the governments which used to shy away from women, peace, and security agenda. OPER, while still in its infancy, is an initiative that can strengthen the role of women in peace and security in the region. And the timing is very critical as women have become more visible in extremist or terrorist activities. There were two women who were suspects in the recent bombing in my hometown of Holo Sulu. Um, one is supposedly an Indonesian and, and one is, um, is from my hometown. This is still to be confirmed, but initiatives like this, acts like this are rare. And what we worry about is they're going to become a little bit more frequent in the future if we do nothing to strengthen women, peace, and security in the region. I would say that returns on investment and capacity building of women, particularly women peace builders and human rights defenders, will be very high. And yet, we see more lip service rather than actual action by some multilaterals who work in, this, uh, in these areas. I'm part of a global call to action to support women peace builders together with women leaders and organizations of a group called the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership. Our secretariat, ICANN, is based in Washington, D.C. And with very little resources, we have managed to keep our network in close contact through weekly web discussions. I would strongly suggest that such efforts, such networks, will be supported as these are the organizations that work at community levels in Palestine, Yemen, Afghanistan, Myanmar, the Philippines, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan, among many, who can be the front line as well of multilateral organizations in the pursuit of the goals that have been identified as critical. 
So we, the members of um, the Women Peace Registry, we came together uh, last June virtually to discuss what we could do to help ASEAN as, as we face two uh, tremendous uh, challenges, security, peace and security, and the pandemic. And we came up with some proposals of our own. The first one being to chart a women, peace and security agenda framework that focus on situations such as the pandemic and other similar humanitarian crises. And this framework will specifically demonstrate the WPS agenda pillars on prevention, participation, protection, recovery and rehabilitation to ensure that girls and women will be treated equitably throughout the event of crisis management, government policy and development programming by multiple stakeholders. This is particularly important as majority of the frontliners are women. And yet the interest, the health, the security of these frontliners are really not top of mind of government and organizations. We believe that if we work on these regional organizations, which have very strong links with civil society, that we can strengthen the, um, the foundations for multilateralism. And if we support uh, the implementation of the WPS agenda and nurture networks such as OPER and WASL, it will go a long way to preserving the democratic space that we see being eroded day by day by challenges that sometimes we feel we cannot, uh, we cannot tackle overwhelmed as we are by the isolated um, uh, existence due to the pandemic. Thank you. I mean, I thank you so much for, for your perspectives and your insights there. And I take away, I mean, there's many points there. I take away two sort of big principal points. One, the importance of strengthening regional organizations and the cooperation with regional organizations because they're closer uh, to the people that need help, because they're closer to uh, where uh, potential problems and, and concerns are, and they can have a far more direct impact. So organizations like ASEAN and many others. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the importance of strengthening women, peace and security efforts in this space to really go beyond lip service uh, to actual action. And, and I like the very concrete example you gave there of the very low cost, not difficult approach to bringing together networks at a, a regular basis. There's a lot of opportunities there, particularly as we spend uh, more time in this, this virtual space. Um, and, and, you know, huge opportunities there also for multilateral actors to be that potential convener for those kinds of discussions and for those kinds of meetings. But that requires those actors to overcome various bureaucratic and political obstacles and, and simply do it and simply bring together uh, these, these actors fail a couple of times. It might be chaotic. Uh, it might be messy, um, but, but it, it's hugely, hugely helpful and insightful uh, to, to, to organize those, those kind of convenings at the regional uh, and, and local level. So thank you uh, for some of those insights. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in uh, via the Q&A as well, so please keep them coming. Thank you for uh, your, your various, uh, uh, various suggestions there. Uh, and we're now going to turn to uh, our uh, final panelist, uh, Amir Makdi, um, researcher in the Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, who has a, a, a very uh, extensive um, a background of, of publications and research on a range of issues, but particularly uh, uh, focused uh, on uh, the Sinai. Uh, Amir, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm really humbled uh, to be with all of you uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> as Eliko uh, uh, presented me, I am a researcher with the Middle East and North Africa Division at Human Rights Watch. Um, I focus mainly on Egypt. Um, so I think I come today with more of an Egypt expertise rather than like globally counter terrorism expertise. Uh, however, what I would like to do in the next few minutes is to maybe shed light on this very practical example of how counterterrorism could be and is grossly and fundamentally misdirected and abused to stripe citizens and people from their rights and humanity. 
And this is done by a government, we are talking about the Egyptian government, that has not only succeeded and presented itself as a credible ally in the regional and global war against uh, terrorism, but also found the boldness to try to reshape some of the legal discussions uh, uh, in regional and international uh, multilateral forum. Uh, so in line with uh, what uh, my colleagues have mentioned, uh, particularly Eric and Laila, uh, on the uh, gaps that remain despite the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, multiplication of these multi multilateral fora, I guess um, my talk will be uh, a little bit microscopic on Egypt experience and Talking about Egypt in that regards is important because it has been the architect, art, art, architect of the, uh, some of the leading damaging uh, uh, efforts in, um, to the uh, normative progress at the UN, both in Geneva and, and, uh, and in New York. So also my uh, talk might be a little bit um, uh, sticking to the orthodox uh, multilateral fora, we are talking about the General Assembly and uh, Human Rights Council mainly. Uh, and while I shed light on um, uh, Egypt's domestic counterterrorism operations and narrative, I invite you to imagine what role a, a government like Egypt could play in those multilateral forum. Uh, for me, counterterrorism is always a battle of competing narratives, and that could be a little bit theoretical, but I, I feel always it's very important, as Michel Foucault perhaps best described it as discursive power. Uh, to control the narrative and to shape the narrative is a very, very important tool in uh, winning the or determining at least the trajectory of a battle. In the very simplistic way, it's the act and the process of finding thousands and tens of thousands of people echoing your chance. Let's kill them all. Let's wipe them off the face of the earth. Um, you know, uh, leave, uh, leave no one alive and so on and so on. By building support for such narrative, you therefore face little or no opposition when you act above and uh, uh, beyond the law. This battle of discourse is mainly about we can summarize it in one word, the process of dehumanization. I would give a very microscopic example of um, in Egypt uh, uh, in August 2013, uh, which I guess uh, most of us have heard of is the Rabah massacre. In July 2013, the army removed or orchestrated the removal of Egypt's elected president, Mohamed Morsi, and that was on the heel of mass anti-Morsi protests. The Egyptian society was very polarized whether or not uh, that was a military coup, I, I, that doesn't really matter for the uh, story I'm telling here. What happened next with the deepening of political polarization, as well as limited but alarming rise in political violence, particularly on the margins of the pro morsi sit-ins, the largest of which was uh, uh, in the Rabah Square in Cairo, where tens of thousands of pro morsi uh, uh, people uh, gathered for weeks. But instead of tackling the particular uh, limited security risks at that time, uh, President Sisi, then he was defense minister, asked Egyptians in, in a public speech to delegate him to fight what he called then possible terrorism. This was a defining moment of what came next because that's precisely the moment I'm talking about when thousands were chanting, let's kill them all. For six weeks, mainstream media in Egypt, which, which was completely controlled by uh, uh, the uh, military pact government, transmitted hours and hours of dehumanizing narrative. Those people, Morsi supporters, don't love Egypt. They don't deserve to be Egyptians. They smell bad. They are having jihad sex in their sit-in and so on and so on. But dehumanization doesn't just work by saying that you hate someone or you hate a particular group, but there is also a lot of disinformation thrown in this propaganda. For example, this sit-in is uh, fully armed. They are uh, heavily armed. They will kill us and et cetera, et cetera. Weeks of dehumanization on TV and mainstream media was followed by security violently dispersing the rabbi sit-in. The result was killing over 1,000 people in less than one day, burning down the mosque and the makeshift hospital that was in the center of the sit-in, summarily executing some of the wounded, failure to provide 
first aid to the wounded and arresting hundreds. By the end of the day, the interior ministry said that they only seized 15 guns. Five of them were handmade. Around eight members of the security were killed. But these disproportionate figures and facts will not be remembered in the fervor of the dehumanizing narrative and rhetoric. Seven years on, there has been no investigation whatsoever into the biggest or one of the largest mass killings of protesters in Egypt's history. And no single, of the, uh, no single member of the government or security forces has been questioned or prosecuted. On the contrary, this process of dehumanization has been copied and uh, in the day-to-day -day security operations. And we see uh, the flourishing of this discourse and rhetoric. Any government critic, or, uh, all government critics are conspirators, traitors, bad people, and so on. And if you support them, then you definitely are one of them. The problem which concerns us more is that if you are a lawyer or a human rights advocate and you want to talk about the rule of law, then you are impeding counter-terrorism efforts or even perhaps one of those people. And so goes the narrative to widen the circle of suspicion and accusation to virtually include everyone who speaks of the rule of law or who criticizes the government from a legal standpoint and not just the political opponents. And that's what's relevant in our discussion today because governments like the Egyptian government, and there are so many in the world, come to these multilateral fora like the Human Rights Council, like the General Assembly, with this mentality, with the very intention to dilute any legal safeguards and to remove human rights language. So, for example, at the center of this relentless campaign by Egypt since 2015 to erode, hum to erode human rights guarantees, um, Egypt has been trying to instrumentalize the approach of what the government calls the effects of terrorism on the enjoyment of human rights. And therefore, by insisting on this approach and this narrative, Egypt has also managed to produce some distorted resolutions in the Human Rights Council and in the General Assembly in 2018 and 2019 that removed actually many safeguards uh, that was built through, uh, I would say, more than a decade of consensus building in these fora. For example, language concerning the derogation in emergencies, uh, principle of non refoulement the right to privacy, the deprivation of liberty, the rights of minorities, and the rights of children, as well as important reference to international treaties such as Geneva Conventions and the Convention Against Torture. And it, these efforts still continue. Egypt really wants to undermine and dilute uh, the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on protecting human rights while counter, countering terrorism, which is almost the only specialized UN instrument concerning the preservation of human rights in countering terrorism. And the language Egypt introduced in this uh, resolution was not new. They exist uh, in so many resolutions and in so many fora and in so many offices across the UN agencies. Uh, what Egypt was trying to do then is to again uh, shape the narrative because shaping the narrative is winning this battle. So I guess the gap that we need to uh, uh, um, address here and um, as civil society and that what concerns me coming from a human rights organization is to uh, always shed light on these efforts to always uh, uh, make sure that any uh, um, discussions happening in the UN or any multilateral fora happen on the grounds of the principles of human rights, happens on the grounds of the uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2006 uh, General Assembly resolution, and uh, that actually national other national governments needs to be aware of these uh, efforts and needs to pressure governments like Egypt to respect human rights domestically and also to stop these attempts globally. So I would stop here and I would welcome uh, any discussions and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. I really appreciate you taking this micro level approach because at the end of the day, all of these international fora, uh, all of these multilateral institutions are made up by their members. Uh, and so what they take from their national context, from a uh, um, uh, local context is influencing 
uh, discussions at the international level. And as we know very well, and Anga is a good example of that, um, you know, there's so many audiences uh, to which uh, these um, uh, governments play to uh, domestically, internationally, regionally. Uh, and so it, it's really critical that we understand um, these uh, micro level, single country, single locality uh, issues and how they then further affect um, our, our international discussions and how some of those issues are taking into uh, those multilateral discussions. So thank you, Amer, uh, for, for sharing that. Uh, we're now going to slowly move into uh, the Q and A slash open discussion uh, part of the um, of the meeting. Uh, we um, uh, have a, a number of pre-listed um, interventions uh, that we will go through first, uh, and then we will address uh, a number of the fantastic questions uh, that all of you have raised uh, through uh, the Q and A. Uh, for those individuals that uh, are going to deliver the shortlisted interventions, uh, please uh, introduce yourselves. Please keep them to th three minutes, uh, preferably with the video turned on, uh, and we will work uh, with you to uh, mute and unmute uh, your microphones and spotlight you. Um, so turning first uh, to Assistant Secretary General Michel Konings, uh, Executive Director of the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee, Executive Director. It's great to have you with us uh, and look forward to uh, your intervention. Uh, thanks so much, Jalko. Thanks also to the panelists for the insightful um, interventions. A few observations as time is uh, running. Uh, in times uh, where terrorism is so complex uh, and asking for uh, global, transnational, multilateral approaches, we see that that multilateralism is more critical than ever, but also a heavily challenged. One of the Joy stoppers is definitely COVID-19, which is uh, having an impact uh, on the socioeconomic uh, uh, um, uh, field, especially in the field of counterterrorism. There, where we need more uh, multilateralism, more uh, counterterrorism measures. We see that, for instance, uh, uh, the civil society organization having a pivotal role in the whole of society um, uh, approach uh, uh, have a, a shrinked um, uh, territory uh, that uh, the uh, member states uh, are focusing more on their national uh, priorities and on CT uh, priorities and certainly not on uh, multilateral CT um, um, uh, initiatives uh, uh, and that in, indeed uh, multilateralism is now more challenging than ever but also a lack of global consensus uh, on uh, transnational issues we see absolutely a rise of uh, uh, nationalism but we also uh, see a, a, a rise of, of threats uh, ISIL, Al-Qaeda and extreme right uh, wing so there is absolutely no need for a, a trust and uh, an erosion and trust uh, multilateralism and solidarity. So we have to work on that as well. A lot of uh, uh, fishermen on the pond, as has been alluded to in, in the panelists, we don't need um, um, uh, silos, we need more coordination and, and solid and effective leadership. Uh, looking, zooming in at UN uh, approach, uh, the Global uh, Counterterrorism Compact is a good example of uh, strengthened uh, partnership solidarity uh, and uh, of exchanges uh, uh, of um, a very valued uh, information and more targeted uh, results. Centrality of the whole of society uh, uh, approach with a big eye to human rights uh, and gender sensitive um, uh, compliance, extremely important because as I just uh, said, uh, heavily hampered by the, 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 the current situation. And also the challenging dynamics uh, within the UN bodies, but also the undeniable role of the Security Council as the only alternative uh, to deal with collective measures that touch uh, peace and security. And finally, zooming in to U, uh, UN CT, uh, CTAT's work, uh, we have a comparative advantage. We are having a constant dialogue with all the 193 uh, member states, liaising with the capitals, uh, uh, reviewing the desks, uh, um, um, uh, um, um, reviews, uh, uh, making sure that we have a, a full insight in what's happening in the 193 uh, counterterrorism um, um, context, uh, and also making sure that we reach out to the resident colonies and country teams. Uh, look at teams, look at uh, regions, and uh, transposing all that material into analytical uh, work, which is then spread uh, to the rest of the world, uh, to all the terrorism experts, uh, policy uh, makers, and interested uh, parties. So we play a vital role in that multilateralism, COVID or no COVID, we continue uh, to work very hard um, and, and still uh, taking um, into consideration that the world is in slow motion, but we didn't slow. Uh, our activity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Konings, for your uh, insights and, and remarks there. I'm turning next to uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Niger to the United Nations, 
uh, Mr. Uh, Awugi Nyandu. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's a busy time, of course, for, for all of you, but particularly for uh, a, um, uh, for those on, on the Council. So we appreciate you uh, participating um, in this, uh, this event. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank uh, Mr. Erno Kessel for the honor of inviting her to this forum, the water to reflection on the future of, of multilateralism in connection with the fight against terrorism. We would also like to salute the various panelists for the quality of the, the quality of their presentation. Our presence at this forum is the testimony, if need be, of the importance my country attached to multilateralism in fight against terrorism. As you know, this forum coincides with the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the UN, whose theme is the future we want, the UN we need, reaffirming our commitment to multilateralism. It's also taking place in a very particular context for the international community, which continues to suffer the negative impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. This health crisis, which began in December 2019 and whose socioeconomic and political consequences have spared no nation, large or small, remind, how, as, how, remind us how urgent it is that we take collective action to defend the pandemic. At the same time, the activities of the terrorist organization, Islamic State, have increased in Iraq, Syria and elsewhere in Africa, as well as in the Sahel region. Terrorist groups seek to exploit to their advantage the inadequacies and fragilities of the international system revealed and exacerbated by the spread of this pandemic. Indeed, from January to April 2020, the African continent recorded 508 terrorist attacks resulting in 2,938 deaths compared to the same period in 2019 when 407 attacks and 2,584 deaths were recorded. Mali, Nigeria, and Niger are among the countries most affected by this scourge. It's not secret that the fight against terrorism is undermined by the lack of a united commitment by the international community to address the challenges posed by this trade. This is another area where multilateralism must prove itself because the terrorist threat is a global threat that undermines the foundation of our organization. With regard to the countries of West Africa and the Lake Chad Basin that create the G5 Sahel Force and the multinational joint force respectively, and that are at the front, fair front of this fight, they must be supported because the consequences of the failure to combat terrorism in this region will severely impact peace and security in other regions. It is our conviction that only international cooperation based on integral multilateralism and the unity of purpose can redress the situation in the Sahel in a sustainable manner. Likewise, we believe that in order to be effective, our counterterrorism action must be inclusive, concentrated, and guided by four pillars of the UNED, United Global Counterterrorism Strategy and the relevant resolution of the Security Council and the General Assembly. In conclusion, Mr. President, we would like to reiterate our thanks and congratulations to you for the organization of this forum the relevance of whose term refer to the foundation and objective of the United Nations. I thank you. Thank you, Deputy Permanent Representative. I really appreciate uh, your uh, remarks uh, during this, this very, uh, very busy time. And of course, the focus on uh, the Sahel there uh, in particular as a region where a number of multilateral uh, and regional actors uh, have been extremely, extremely active in this space. Uh, we're going to turn next to Rafi Shah, uh, Chief of Policy, Knowledge Management and Coordination Branch of the United Nations Office of Current Terrorism. Rafi, it's good to see you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Elko, uh, and uh, to your uh, 
excellent team for organizing this timely and much needed discussion on multilateralism. I would also like to thank the expert panel for the insightful remarks. Uh, um, we, we see Eric uh, Rosen would always raise some new questions and uh, push us to think a little bit more and more creatively. Multilateralism of late has been under threat and faces a difficult future. We have a surplus of multilateral challenges, but a deficit of multilateral solutions. Uh, people are losing faith in rule-based global order while polarization, inward-looking nationalism, and protectionism are on the rise. The pandemic has laid bare systemic and entrenched inequalities that are testing the resilience of societies. The pandemic is also exacerbating socioeconomic grievances and fueling conflicts, creating fertile grounds for the spread of terrorism and violent extremism. The world faces a new and non-traditional security challenge, and no country could weave its way out of those in isolation. That is why we need a more willing approach to an effective, inclusive, and reinvigorated multilateralism. This was highlighted by UN Secretary General yesterday at the General Assembly ceremony marking the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. It was also a key message from UN Virtual Counterterrorism Week in July that many of you attended. So how do we reinvigorate multilateralism to strengthen global counterterrorism efforts? Here are a few thoughts, quick thoughts rather. First, we need a renewed commitment to the values of the United Nations Charter, which remains relevant, as relevant today as it was at the end of the Second World War. This means that all measures to counterterrorism must fully protect and promote human rights and fundamental freedoms and uphold the rule of law. UN Office of Counterterrorism is working with the government of Spain to organize a regional high-level conference on human rights and rule of law to counterterrorism in Malaga next year. Second, we should reinvest we should revisit narrow definitions of multilateralism that are limited to engagement with a couple of categories of partners. We should think more horizontally as well as vertically. Think about new partners. Partners. The 21st century societies have evolved more rapidly as we, than we expected. And there are new well-informed actors who could contribute to social cohesion and resilience in a more meaningful way than we expect government partners to contribute. Third, we must continue to invest in long-term preventive measures to build back better and address the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism as a part of comprehensive approach to build resilience against violent extremism. Fourth, we need to support the counterterrorism efforts of most effective countries by providing technical assistance and mobilizing funding in a more coordinated and sustained manner, involving civil society and other related partners, but also demand effective monitoring and evaluation of the impact in return from the recipients of the capacity building assistance. Lastly, in an ever-changing world, multilateralism needs to be dynamic and forward-looking, moving beyond reactionary multilateralism. Together, we should aim to build a better world, a world which is in peace with itself and free of terrorism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafi, for uh, your insights and, and comments there. Um, we're now going to turn next to uh, Rebecca Skellett, uh, head of the Strong Cities Network. Uh, Becky, we look forward to, to hearing from you. Welcome. Hi Alka, hi everyone. Um, as Alka says, I head up the, the Strong Cities Network. My name is Becky Skellett. So it will come hopefully as no surprise to you that I plan to use my intervention to talk about cities and their important role in diplomacy. Um, by 2050, I'm sure most of you know that 68% of the world's population will live in urban areas. And this urbanization leads to significant new threats from political violence and terror attacks to increases in hate crime and online disinformation 
Today's challenges are both global priorities and local realities. And some of these are P and CVE challenges, but many are not. Since we launched the Strong Cities Network, the intensity of all of these challenges has continued only to increase. And today, me and my team work with over 140 members from across the world. And next week, uh, we celebrate our five years of, of being, and we hope many of you can join our similar side event. Um, just a, a small little uh, pipe and showcase to, uh, to those watching today. But across the network, we see cities take an enormous plethora of responses to tackling these challenges. Many put in place robust prevention efforts that involve all sectors of society, from social workers to teachers. Many look at this as a polarization challenge and look at a response that encourages the building of values and human rights that can be shared by all citizens. And lastly, all take an approach that's partnership based, um, working with communities, their national governments, local governments, both near and far. And again, all of these steps are some sometimes in the name of P and CVE, but many of these things are just done for the sake of good governance and for the strength of, of good communities and that are resilient. But one partnership um, that I'm really surprised often doesn't come up in the form of our work is that with the multilateral community. And whilst on one hand we've heard today the crucial role that the multilateral community plays in setting global norms, measures and embracing and putting in place conformity around key issues including CT and CVE. We've seen extremist groups exploit opportunities where these norms are not up upheld. And the emergence of what one speaker referred to as trust decay um, is just one of many examples that have enabled uh, many extremist groups to enter an anti-democratic attitude into the mainstream. And we're seeing a huge transformation of how citizens' attitudes to one another and the outside world are changing. And going forward, we have to ensure that the multilateral system provides real tangible offers of support for local level actors. And to do that, we have to better involve, integrate and reflect the realities of the ground. As the role of city diplomacy will only grow over the coming decades, now is the time for us to increase the role of locally elected leaders who stand uniquely pl placed to take these conversations that happen at UNGA annually into meaningful local action. And some of this will be done for P and CVE, some of this will be done for the implementation of SDGs, but ultimately we have to start seeing cities as, as a microcosm that can help build the groundswell needed to protect the democratic space that extremist groups are successfully exploiting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Becky, and thank you for bringing uh, the cities as another layer um, in, in our discussion to, to the table, uh, all terrorism indeed is local and, and most of the responses that happen in communities, particularly on the prevention side, um, uh, find themselves in one way or the other interacting with uh, the uh, local local government. So thank you for, for highlighting that important element of this discussion, how it connects to the multilateral space. Uh, we're turning next uh, to um, Francisco Fontan, the head of the counterterrorism division of the European Union's External Action Service. Uh, Francisco, the floor is yours. Hi, Elko, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. We can't see you just yet, but we can hear you. Well, if you don't see me, you're not missing much. Um, but of course, <laughs> we'll be much better. I can I can see you very well, and now maybe... We can see you, go right ahead. Can you see us go. now? Mm -hmm. Okay, I go ahead then. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elko, and thank you for the Global Center uh, to give me the opportunity to uh, display here in, uh, in a succinct manner um, our views on the city domain and multilateralism. They're both uh, very wide uh, issues. Um, in our views, this is a matter that has to be tackled without much uh, doubt at local, national, and multilateral level. It's not one or the other, it's, it's the three of them. Uh, but the global angle and the regional angle is only growing as technology and communication grows exponentially. So those three uh, spaces continue to exist, but the latest, the one that has to do with the regional level, with the multilateral level, it's, uh, let's say, entering uh, more, um, a more and having more and more of a dimension of, of the issues that you see uh, locally. Um, this is nothing new, but it is, ex this is exponentially developing uh, um, every year as, as we grow uh, every year a bit older. We face many challenges, um, one of which is to actually link this, these three levels. Um, 
But of course, you have the economic, the political, the technological, or the environmental issues that underpin uh, or helps extremism to thrive and, and to do harm. So, so the challenge is uh, multi uh, multi-dimensional. The battle against CT is therefore carried out um, one way or another in many other multilateral tables where CT might not be the only consideration or the main consideration, but will have a, a enormous uh, a impact on, on, on how we uh, counter it. Uh, if I can state uh, uh, the obvious, uh, coming from the European Union, counterterrorism remains a key priority of the Union in the security field. Um, all threats like jihadism, extremism are still around um, and dangerous, and new threats have come to our horizon, such extreme right uh, terrorism, the use of disruptive uh, new uh, technologies uh, by terrorists, which need to be better understood and countered. Wars on developments in Africa, most notably in the Sahel region, but also in the Horn, continue to fester with threats of metastasis in relatively farther away areas. There is no way they manage to carry to fight this uh, by their own, and, uh, and we are not uh, collectively having so much success uh, to do it, but uh, clearly we don't all contribute. It's very difficult to imagine any kind of solution. Um, if you look at you know Central South Southeast Asia, uh, terrorism again has not been defeated, and and it won't be uh, for a long time precisely because of structural reasons below in some cases, and because of the challenge of linking the local, national, and regional levels. If you do not you do not have regional organizations such as ASEAN that we saw before, or if I may say the European Union, you will not find uh, regional solutions, and this is also true at the multilateral level. The COVID pandemic has been mentioned before will give a further spin to the whole equation, and this will be uh, to need. Uh, we will need to factor these uh, um, as we speak. EU member states uh, just reiterated the commitment to further strengthen the external dimension of, of EU and emphasizing values already mentioned before by uh, our UN colleagues, um, putting human rights, humanitarian action, and prevention uh, uh, at its core. It's not just about uh, values, it's also about effectiveness. It's also about uh, respecting the not no harm principle intrinsically. Um, of course, multilateralism is well known to be at the heart of the of the EU approach, and we will continue uh, building and strengthening strategic partnerships that we have with leading global actors in this field. Many present here today, with first and foremost the United Nations uh, at the center. And uh, I make, uh, in this sense, uh, in this 75th anniversary, mind the words that my friend uh, Rafi Shah uh, just made. Um, we already have a solid base for cooperation between the EU and the UN, including uh, a high-level political dialogue every year with all the agencies. Um, our cooperation with uh, you know, CT uh, could not be closer, and and the same is true uh, with uh, with the city that I salute here. Uh, Michelle Connis, with whom I've been in another uh, video conference just uh, uh, one hour ago, and the same is true with other uh, global uh, compact uh, um, entities with whom we have a growing uh, a portfolio of projects. Um, just just to just to finish, uh, to mention again uh, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, uh, we where we are a, a member and we strongly work with their inspiring institutions like Hedaya, like JERF, like uh, IIG, who do an, an amazing and, and excellent, excellent uh, job on the ground, but with a, with a, with a global um, optics. Also to remember um, other fora, uh, they're not so often mentioned, such as FATF, where really important work is also, is also carried out with a systemic uh, uh, impact. And uh, last and not not least, and I finish here. Uh, uh, you know, on the 29th of, of, of September, we'll have the ministerial meeting on the group of friends of victims of, of terrorism. And I mentioned this not just uh, just to uh, uh, to salute and to and to honor them, but to. Uh, remind all of us at, at the global level, at the national level, at the local level, what is at the end of the day uh, uh, the driving force of our action. It's not just politics, it's not just security, it's to stop uh, a, a curse that's making uh, suffering uh, millions and millions of people. I stop here. I uh, look forward to the review of the UN Global Counterterrorism uh, Strategy uh, for the next year that should be central in all the uh, global efforts uh, to tackle this, this curse. Thank you very much, Elko. I stop here. Thank you so much, Francisco. You touched on a, a lot of important topics there, including uh, the existence of a range of other entities like the FATF and the role that they've played uh, in, in this space. And also, of course, uh, the review of the global counterterrorism strategy. Whilst postponed from this year, uh, it will happen um, in this new um, uh, General Assembly uh, sometime next year. And that really is a critical point uh, where um, uh, we all have an opportunity, but particularly member states have a specific opportunity and responsibility uh, to um, uh, hold uh, ourselves uh, accountable, uh, to hold our, our uh, joint efforts uh, to light and, and find ways in which we can continue to improve uh, upon, upon them uh, going, going forward. 
Um, last but not least, on our shortlisted um, uh, list of uh, interventions, uh, we have Georgia Holmer, uh, Head of Unit uh, Action Against Terrorism at the Organization for Security and Cooperation uh, in Europe. Georgia, thanks for joining us. Uh, look forward to your intervention. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you to the Global Center for the invitation to join this discussion today. I think it's a very timely one and an important one. A couple of the speakers so far have talked about um, the relevance of regional intergovernmental organizations. So I'll take uh, my intervention to talk about what I see as the unique added value of the OSCE to this important area of international policy. So first of all, I think it's important to note that the mandate of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe working on anti-terrorism or counterterrorism issues dates back to 2002, which means that it was fueled its establishment and the establishment of the unit that I have here it was fueled by the awareness post 9-11 that terrorism was a transnational threat and a security issue that was not confined to national boundaries and also an increasing awareness that a coordinated international response was vital. Um, our unit was designed to provide the 57 participating st states of the OSCE support in implementing the international framework on counterterrorism. Of course, that framework has, has grown exponentially since 2001. Uh, and as a number of speakers have mentioned, this is a much more crowded, complex landscape than it was when this unit was first set up. Secondly, uh, the unit here exists to support and be a resource hub for our 13 field missions. And I, that's a very important point, is that the OSCE is an organization where the bulk of the actual capacity building work happens on the ground. And um, most of you know that our missions, our robust missions are located mostly in Central Asia and Southeastern Europe. So that is where the focus of our work is. Um, we're, we also exist, and our mandate also um, stretches to, um, to direct us to help advance good practices across the region and to provide a neutral platform for dialogue uh, to enable the consensus building that's needed to advance, advance international cooperation. And I think we have uh, provided that service. I think we've done that well. And for those of you who tuned into our OSC-wide counterterrorism conference last week, you were hopefully able to track how the various interventions from government representatives highlighted areas of convergence and disagreement on international counterterrorism policy issues and priorities. And so I, I think that fora like the one provided by the OSCE really helps lay bare some of the points of division and alignment, which is crucial to understand if we're, what we're trying to do is advance a coordinated um, level of response. <clears throat> There's an important assumption that underpins the idea of a multilateral approach to counterterrorism, and that is that a common enemy or a common pro problem builds collaboration among states who may in fact have other significant points of conflict. And I'm not sure whether this is true or not. It, it actually reflects a larger debate of the value of multilateralism in the, today's modern and multipolar world. But the point is that platforms for intergovernmental dialogue are crucial to the larger and common objective of promoting peace. And a regional one is more likely to reach a point of consensus than a fully international and global platform. I see two other unique contributions by the OSCE to the international counterterrorism agenda. One is our specialized focus on capacity building in Central Asia and Southeastern Europe, which as I mentioned, builds upon the work of our field missions. Uh, as a quick example, our unit developed a series of guidebooks related to PBE over the past two years that were tailored for Southeastern Europe. What that means when we say it's tailored, it means that it highlighted case studies from the region, that it was, they were translated into local languages. And we convened policymakers and local practitioners in regional dialogues that allowed for significant sharing and learning across countries. So in this way, the OSCE has a certain kind of specialized expertise, reach and access to build capacity in these particular regions where issues related to terrorism are often intertwined with conflict dynamics and other complex issues. And I think this sort of very local contextual expertise is vital to making those vertical, vertical connections that Eric alluded to. Finally, and perhaps most important, is that the OSCE is an organization, is one organization that has both an explicit human rights and a security mandate, meaning that we can ensure a full integration of human rights standards and norms into all of the work that we do. 
So much of what we do around building the counterterrorism capacity of law enforcement actors or criminal justice actors is really focused on advancing rule of law principles and ensuring compliance with human rights standards. So I think that this emphasis on understanding uh, human rights as a cornerstone of counterterrorism strategy, the fact that we live in the nexus of those two worlds is particularly relevant now as we all continue to try to navigate our work and our world under this current pandemic. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Georgia, for, for sharing uh, the many uh, uh, efforts that the OSC has undertaken in, in, in this space and continues to do so um, uh, as, as a really important uh, regional, regional actor. Uh, we're moving now with uh, about half an hour left on the clock uh, into our um, uh, a broader Q&A discussion. We've got a range of fantastic questions that uh, came in uh, both before as well as during the meeting. And so what I'm going to do is um, uh, uh, indicate um, a question for answering by these one or two panelists uh, each time, get a response, uh, and I maybe have the chance to at least move through uh, a couple of them uh, before before we have to have to close. Uh, we will try to answer any other questions that may have come in uh, as a follow-on to the meeting as well. Uh, so rest assured that we will do our best to uh, be able to, to tackle those uh, those various questions, even if you don't hear them responded to uh, in the remaining half hour. Um, so let me start maybe with Eric and Amina. Um, Eric, one of our participants said uh, uh, or noted that you spoke of the need to engaging development actors and, and a broader range of sort of non-security, non-counterterrorism actors uh, in uh, in the counterterrorism and CV space. Uh, but this engagement, but how can we strengthen this type of engagement when many of those actors are still reluctant to work on issues of counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism and see these kinds of calls of engagements? Uh, and the actual engagement uh, themselves as efforts to really co-opt them or to securitize the space that they work in. So Eric, I would appreciate some of your thoughts there, and I will turn to Amina for some perspectives uh, from the um, ASEAN perspective, and also particularly on uh, the uh, interplay between sort of the counterterrorism and the WPS, uh, the Women, Peace and Security space. Eric. Thank you, and it's a, it's a question that's been, uh, it's a good question, and it's been sort of, uh, uh, out there for many, uh, many years now. And I think there are a couple of ways to answer that. One is uh, there are plenty of development actors that are in this in the security space comfortably. Uh, and they are in that space because they're aware that the lack of security undermines development uh, gains and that uh, major development institutions are um, in this space as well. And a lot of the programs that they support um, are uh, at the nexus between security and development. I think the problem arises when it's counterterrorism fora that try to draw in development actors. Um, counterterrorism fora with very specific security mandates and kinetic, more kinetic um, uh, focus uh, that draw those, uh, try to draw those development actors in. And I think there, there's plenty of space in the, in the World Bank and the OECD where conversations that I'm talking about can take place where security actors should come to the table and participate in uh, discussions and agendas set by the peace building and development community around these issues. And I think the fact that there are these separate um, silos, separate conversations, and not a place, a shared space where these issues can be discussed is part of the problem. And this gets at my final recommendation in my remarks was, is that the lack of a space where a sort of a silo free space where the issues are simply how do you address violence, conflict and fragility in a particular part of a country, in a particular region, in a particular continent. The fact that you don't have that is a real gap and you end up then having these very polarizing debates, polarizing conversations between quote unquote counterterrorism stakeholders and quote unquote, um, uh, conflict prevention, development, peace building stakeholders. And it doesn't need, the divide is artificially um, uh, exaggerated, I think, because of, their, of the lack of a common space. And I think time is right for this common space to be developed uh, and agreed to by both uh, sides. Thanks, Eric. Turning to Amina. Thank you. In, um, in ASEAN, uh, several countries have actually um, worked on the National Action Plan 
for prevention of violent extremism. The Philippines has one, uh, Indonesia has a very good one. But unfortunately, even as we see the dire need to implement this because uh, violent extremists do not recognize COVID as a, as a barrier, governments and ASEAN itself has put much of the resources on the pandemic and rightly so. So the problem that we now face, we still have um, humanitarian organizations, uh, women's organizations working at the community level on women, peace and security, on countering and preventing violent extremism, but the resources for them to do so are getting more and more uh, scarce. And that is something that we need to really address. We realize that uh, the global economy is um, uh, having extreme pressures because of COVID and that governments have to work on uh, the issues of health and, uh, and the economy. But as the recent bombing in the, my hometown proves, if you do not address the, the roots, the issues surrounding the violent uh, extremism that has found its way in, uh, into Southeast Asia, then the triggers for, well, I guess more moves towards a recession in our economies are, are going to be there. You will have triggered additional um, a time bomb, so to speak. The only way we can see of helping out is for civil society organizations who have been collaborating with our governments and with ASEAN in um, community-based work, in advocacy work on PVE, um, as well as uh, peace advocacy, is for these groups to be supported. And I think the multilateral organizations have windows, have um, instruments that can do this, but it is not coordinated. I think the UN has relied a lot on governments implementing their national action plans for PVE, and they have relied on governments uh, to implement the previous national action plan on uh, women, peace, and security, but the monitoring uh, has never been there. So you don't know how deeply or how widely uh, such initiatives um, have taken place. So we need to have these conversations with the organizations that are out there doing the work, and we need to make sure that the resources do flow to support them. Um, this organization, this network that I am a part of, uh, launched a, a call to action for governments and multilateral organizations to stand with women peace builders. And there are four pillars that uh, we hope will be supported because by doing so, it will also strengthen the foundations of multilateralism at the community level. The first one, obviously, is the safety of the women peace builders who are in the conflict areas. The second is the obligation to implement laws and policies and full inclusion. The third is appreciation of women peace builders for the vital role they play. This might seem uh, insignificant, but no, it's not. And lastly, and very, very important, is resources to sustain the women peace builders to enable their work. So in other words, SOAR. And um, I'm, I'm uh, really thinking from the civil society point of view, if some resources will continue to flow to initiatives such as this, to networks such as this, in collaboration with regional uh, intergovernmental organizations, then we will have gone a long way in strengthening the foundation, not just of the prevention part, prevention for violent extremism, but will also go a long way in strengthening the weakening roots of multilateralism in our communities. Thanks so much, Amina and, and Eric, for those those very helpful helpful insights. Um, a second question that I, I, I came up in a, in a number of um, questions raised by participants was around the centrality of human rights, and, and Georgia just just now in her 
uh, intervention also also raised this. You know, the importance of human rights at the center of any and all counterterrorism PV responses on the one hand, but then the very fact that the centrality of human rights uh, in these efforts is very clearly under threat, both in uh, at the multilateral level, but also, of course, very much in, in national responses. And, and maybe I'll turn to, to Leila and to Amer uh, uh, for, for this question. You know, as, as member-driven organizations, what can and what should uh, the United Nations and other multilateral institutions do to push back uh, on uh, human rights being under threat, on civil space uh, being, being under threat? And what, what can they do, given that some of their own members uh, are, are the very countries um, uh, that uh, might be implementing uh, some of these uh, these measures, um, and then also on on the flip side, what can civil society, what can human rights organizations undertake uh, to continue to push for uh, human rights at the core of counterterrorism and PVE responses? I'll, I'll turn to to Lila first, and then to uh, Amar. Uh, thank you, Elcro, for that question, and, and thank you to the people who have raised this issue, um, the panelists and others uh, in the in the chat um, field here. Um, first, I, I'd really like to just um, um, emphasize and just underline that the, the, the great work that Amina Rasul and her, her partners do, I mean, this is um, very much, I know I've benefited from their insights um, in, in the work that I've done, both in, in government and elsewhere, um, as really witnesses of what's going on in the ground. In, incredibly useful when it comes to designing policy, uh, being really witnesses from the ground. And this is the kind of, I think, initiatives that we, we could all benefit from. Um, but it comes with a with a responsibility as well. And I mean, I alluded to that, um, you know, in the protection area, um, et cetera. And that brings me on to the, uh, on to the question, Elko, that you raised, um, the centrality of human rights. I think it's in all our policies, in, 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 in designing and, and coming up with measures of countering terrorism, countering violent extremism, we'll, we'll, um, we'll really fail if we don't put that, um, uh, those principles at the center of our counterterrorism CVE efforts. And this is not just a word um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, included in the speech somewhere, but this is really, truly, um, uh, you know, something that we should keep in mind wherever we are, wherever we may be in, in, in designing um, strategies and counterterrorism. I think um, at, at all diff different levels, that will, be, that will be important and is important. Um, and again, uh, drawing on, on the witnesses, you know, and the people in the field um, that, that we've seen their experiences, I think it's just um, extreme, extremely important that, that that becomes a pillar stone in that, um, and in and in um, ensuring that that is part of it. Um, in order to ensure that that is part of it, human rights is at the center of it. Um, it, it becomes even more important to have the partnerships that we're talking about here, to have that open line of dialogue. And, and for those of us who, who have been part of governments, who are part of governments, who really say that this is part of our government policies, I think it's important not to shy away from, uh, you know, the principles that we have, wherever we meet and whoever we meet, um, this becomes part of our, uh, of our um, uh, strategy. Uh, and we can see that and, and prioritize it in terms of the partners that we choose, the topics that we choose to put on the agenda, um, the people that we include, and there'll be different ways of bringing up this agenda um, um, in, in, our, in, our, in, in the work that we do, whether it's the form of research questions that we ask, whether it's the form of, of partners, as I said, that we partner with, or whether it's the, uh, in form of uh, what kind of strategies we really would like to see. But it lies, there lies a responsibility, I think, in, on all of us to make sure that this becomes central to our counterterrorism efforts and CVE efforts, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Um, Amar. Uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, for your uh, very insight, uh, uh, wonderful insights. Um, I think regarding human rights, and maybe I'm biased here coming from a human rights organization, but I guess uh, what we always emphasize is that um, there, just as Lina said, there is no uh, long-term success in the fight against terrorism and extremism without emphasizing the centrality of human rights and without preserving human rights as uh, 
much as possible, as much as international norms and standards uh, uh, tell us and guide us. Uh, and that's evident in, in practice. We are not just talking theoretically. Look at the Middle East, uh, where much of this uh, counterterrorism uh, and terrorist, uh, terrorist groups have been uh, happening in the past uh, decades. Uh, and you see that it's, uh, we are almost uh, revolving in vicious circles. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, or most of the land in Iraq has been liberated from ISIS, but then security forces come and uh, inflict the same injustice and uh, the same horrific uh, sort of treatment and detention conditions and mass atrocities on the uh, population, the, the very same population that fled uh, their lands uh, fearing ISIS. And we just keep revolving in these vicious circles precisely because uh, we make the state, not the human, the center of our response. And because we fail to, to have the courage to, to reimagine uh, uh, new security uh, politics. Um, I think our role as, as human rights organizations, local and international, is to uh, uh, um, insist on engagement, meaningful engagement with uh, national governments, uh, with actors. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I would say that the response is not homogenous. There are governments that are, there is some space for engagement, uh, for uh, discussing things. Uh, and there are other governments in almost an open war against human rights uh, and uh, openly uh, antagonizing uh, most of the basic human rights principles, such as the Egyptian government. And in that sense, there is a responsibility in, mul in multilateral fora and in bilateral relationships with other national governments is to uh, pressure those governments to uh, show openness, uh, to discuss things with the civil society, uh, and to bring in private sector and private uh, uh, and other partners and uh, stakeholders. Um, there, there are so many other challenges when we talk about human rights and counterterrorism, including uh, some challenges raised by uh, the recent rise of uh, terrorism. For example, in the wake of ISIS defeat in, in some Arab countries, uh, there was a question about uh, international law. For example, when you capture a city bag, how long can you detain suspects? And is that a detention or is it like, uh, uh, you know, other, otherwise? And uh, to what extent international norms could apply here? And these all need more creative discussions. Uh, but again, I think the more uh, fundamental and traditional problem we face is again that when evil uh, acts and atrocities are committed by armed groups, we call them terrorists. But when the same acts are co committed by national governments and official entities, we call them other things, including counterterrorism, ironically. And that's, that's the main problem here, I guess, that we need to um, relentlessly bring back uh, human rights into discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a responsibility for uh, uh, the UN agencies also uh, to, to make sure uh, this, this is happening. And, and I would say, for example, sometimes you are, uh, I would say, uh, struck by a very um, incomprehensible action, like the UN Office uh, Counterterrorism wanted to, or was open to discussing uh, an invitation by Egypt to host a regional conference on counterterrorism. So uh, stuff like that that sends the very wrong signal that you don't want to send should be avoided. Uh, an open discussion should always be there. Uh, and um, that's, I think, the, at least the minimum that could be done to uh, maintain uh, us on the right track. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mara. Maybe, maybe building on that and, and turning uh, perhaps to, to Eric and, and Amina for, for some thoughts on this question is, you know, many civil society organizations are active in this space and in, in the counterterrorism, preventing violent extremism space um, or contributing uh, at the very least to, to this space. Many are eager to, to work with, to partner with regional, international uh, and multi uh, multilateral organizations. But I found it quite difficult. I found it difficult because um, either they uh, don't really understand um, uh, the uh, complexity of those organizations, the roots in the many entities that exist uh, in, 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 the, um, um, uh, in these kinds of international organizations. Um, it's difficult because uh, the 
um, uh, the organization themselves often have a number of thresholds uh, that prevent them from easily bringing together a, a group of, of non-governmental actors to discuss certain issues or to be able to work with them or resource them. What would be some of your principal um, uh, recommendations for, um, let's focus on the United Nations, for the United Nations to really be able to uh, get to a next level of meaningful and sustained engagement uh, with civil society. I'll, I'll turn to Eric and then uh, to Amina uh, for, for some thoughts on that question. Um, thank you, uh, Elko, for the question. Um, and it's obviously been an issue that's been uh, sort of, again, uh, on the agenda for a number of years, and we've seen some progress here and there, but I think fundamentally one of the challenges is that um, uh, it's it's a, um, as one senior UN counterterrorism official recently in the last couple of years noted that if you're boarding a plane, the member states are, are boarding first class, um, the UN officials are in business class and civil society is in economy, and I, I commented, well, civil society is often not even on the plane. Um, and I think that's part of the problem is this perception that, that this is a member state dominant organization, which it is, and that um, the, the goal here is for civil society to help member states. Um, when in fact, the problems we're talking about, at least in this call, but on, on other, uh, others as well today, um, the, um, the problems are at the lo very local level and it should be what the UN can do and member states can do to help these communities. And I think fundamentally it's, it's always been about um, the UN inviting civil society into its space as opposed to finding again this common space that is not dominated by the UN, not dominated by civil society, but is a shared space. And I think so long as we're continuing to, to think about ways in which the UN, whether it's UNOCT or CTED, can include civil society in its work, then I think we're just recycling the problem. And we have to reformulate the issue is how can the UN help civil society, uh, help local actors do their work better? Um, and how can the UN enter their space? Um, it's not about inviting civil society to one-off conferences. It's about this larger issue of how can the UN totally change how it thinks about the problem and what its role is. And I think this leads me to one, one comment that I'd like to make, which before turning it over to Lila, um, which is that for many uh, years before, um, right after 9-11, a lot of governments were skeptical of what the UN could, could deliver on counterterrorism because it was seen as too political, too bureaucratic, too process oriented a body and too New York centric a discussion of counterterrorism. And therefore there wasn't a lot of growth in that architecture in New York. Fast forward, that architecture has grown exponentially to the point where it's a very large part of the UN in New York, but those problems still exist. And so I think the, the risk we have now is that as there's a need to go more and more local, more and more into the sort of understanding civil society, supporting civil society, the bureaucracy in New York is just growing and growing and growing, making it ever more difficult for it to overcome the political barriers, overcome the bureaucratic hurdles, overcome the state-centric approach that really needs to be overcome if we're actually going to solve the problems on the ground. So I think it's a real conundrum. I, I, the, the UN can continue to find sort of micro ways to support civil society or involve civil society. I applaud all of those, but that's not what this is really about. This is about how the UN can totally transform how it thinks about the role of civil society in this space and find ways to enter that civil society space and be supportive of them. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. Uh, Amina, turning to you, maybe maybe there are some good practices or some examples or some lessons learned from uh, the ASEAN context or other regional forums that the UN could, could take at, at heart here, uh, or um, um, examples of how not to do it. Both, both are equally, both are equally uh, valuable, so I appreciate your insights. Well, the, the ASEAN approach of slow and sure uh, and consensus has uh, pluses and minuses. So I'm not going to take I'm not going to take that up today. Um, but what I would like to uh, to really put on the table are the initiatives that are coming from civil society itself. For instance, the initiative to create established networks to expand networks in ASEAN. This has become uh, an active area 
because of the push of Indonesia and the Philippines for the establishment of the National Action Plans for PVE, and before that, the National Action Plan for uh, Women, Peace, and Security. But the support by multilateral organizations is not as robust as we would like it to be. Uh, you're right, uh, when, um, when um, Eric was talking about, and, and I think the others were talking about the one-off uh, conferences being not enough, we always think um, if you spend $5,000 per head to bring a representative of a civil society organization from my hometown in Sulu to New York to participate in a two-day conference, we think about what that $5,000 would mean if it was provided directly to the organization so it could do its work at the community level. The problem is the multilaterals still do not have the infrastructure to deal with um, uh, working with these organizations. No receipts or you use um, a little piece of paper, scrap of paper for a receipt for transportation, for hiring a, a boat, for instance. How do we do this? The second is what is the, the what have the multilaterals and the regional organizations really done to strengthen the capacity of these organizations to work on a level acceptable to multilaterals? I remember that the US um, AID several years ago put together a fund whereby they chose 120 small organizations nationwide and some large national organizations to come together for a whole year of training and mentoring. Is that at all possible? We need that now because the, the times are even more uh, critical than they were before. And um, lastly, I would like to bring up the... Um, the role that can be played, a very strong role that can be played by very, very credible faith-based organizations. Um, in the, for the Catholic faith, for instance, you have the Catholic Relief uh, Service. What is the possibility for, for Catholic majority countries like the Philippines, you could actually work with such organizations and provide a window that can now be uh, you know, provided to community organizations who work on prevention of violent extremism. Because after all, peace is a foundation that is essential for faith-based uh, faith organizations. Thank you so much, Amina, also for raising the role of faith-based organizations, which was, a, which was a question that came up uh, in a number of um, uh, Q&A inputs from, from participants. With five minutes left on the clock, I have one final question uh, for which I will turn to each of the panelists for a very short one to two minute response. Um, also your time uh, to say uh, whatever you would like to say uh, before, uh, uh, before the meeting, the meeting uh, ends. And I'll, I'll turn to Leila, uh, Amer, Amina, and then end uh, with, with Eric. So my final question is, is the following. Uh, in the Global Center's upcoming Blue Sky 5 report, which should be coming out in about two weeks' time, we discuss four main roles uh, that the United Nations, and for that matter, several other multilateral and regional organizations have to play in the counterterrorism and PVE space as a norm setter, as a convener, as a technical assistance provider, and as a global monitor. And I'm curious to hear from you what area, in your opinion, is most crucial uh, to coherent multilateral counterterrorism efforts and what areas should be prioritized over others uh, moving forward. So as a norm uh, setter, as a convener, as a technical assistance provider, uh, and or as a, as a global monitor. Um, Leila, we'll turn to you first. Thank you, Elko, for, um, uh, for that easy question. Um, I would say all of them at the same time. Um, um, I, I, I would really say all of them. However, I do think that um, uh, there are the two, I mean, convener without doubt, a convener um, of getting different partners together, creating that safe space where, where, where ideas, um, experiences um, uh, are shared. I think that that's a really important uh, important role, making sure that everyone gets a seat at the table, uh, the different actors that we're here speaking with today and those who are not here today, um, um, uh, recognizing that the, the landscape 
continues to change and new actors, um, as some people here in the panel mentioned, there will be new actors who, who we haven't thought of today or didn't think of a few, few, few years or a decade ago that are now should be on the, at the table. Um, and then um, uh, I, I think uh, technical assistance as well is extremely important in that developing the know-how, the expertise for, for the people who will be sitting around the table so that we speak each other's languages, so that we languages, the terminology, that we understand what we're talking about, that we can translate what's being seen from the field and onto the, the, to the people bringing it into policy, etc. I'll leave it at that and thank you all for, for the opportunity to be part of this. Good luck. Thank you, Laila. Uh, turning to Amar. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with uh, Laila that the four of them are uh, really fundamental and important. Uh, I would say that um, uh, the two uh, uh, pillars, uh, norm setter and monitoring, uh, these two rules we have seen sort of a decline in the UN, uh, in the rules uh, and, and spaces, play, you know, uh, in which the UN agencies try to engage, even on the level of the uh, uh, Secretary General. Also, we say we see less uh, uh, criticism to uh, uh, gross human rights violations. We see uh, a decline in uh, uh, naming perpetrators, in, in um, pressuring uh, perpetrators to, to uh, you know, end their violations and so on. Um, and uh, at the same time, when uh, perhaps whatever you want to say, it's stable democracy or whatever countries, developed countries sort of like shy of emphasizing the uh, importance of human rights norms, you see actually arise on the side, uh, on the side of the perpetrators and the most, uh, the governments that violate human rights the most, uh, you see arise in their boldness in, in actually introducing distorted uh, um, uh, image and distorted idea and conception of uh, human rights and, and counter-terrorism. Uh, so that's why I would emphasize really the, uh, these two rules as norm setter and monitoring. Um, and I think uh, uh, convener is also very important because in many situations, a conflict could be avoided or at least de-escalated if uh, there is uh, a proper third party intervention at the, at the critical point. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amir. Uh, turning to uh, Amina for her uh, final thoughts. Well, I, I agree with Laila and Amir. The four are equally important. Uh, but having said that, let me just uh, 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 talk a little bit about um, monitoring and the provision of technical assistance. Laila, technical assistance is really great. It's necessary, but I think it should actually include actual financial resources and other resources to keep the, the organizations um, going. As far as monitoring is concerned, I bring you back to my nightmare that I had mentioned earlier about the expansion of social media. In ter into territories, into areas that are actually uh, compressing our democratic space. And I wonder whether the United Nations and other multilateral organizations can actually have um, uh, a better strategy in monitoring so that the information does come out, is accepted as something that is based on truth. In other words, how do you uh, counter fake news and truth decay. Because if you can't do that, then your monitoring is not going to work. Thanks, Amina. Eric, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would agree that all four are important. Uh, and I would think that um, in, a, in an ideal world, norm setting and global monitoring would be the priorities. Because of the, or the most important, but because of the politics at the UN and the significant differences uh, uh, between and among member states on what to prioritize in terms of uh, counterterrorism and approaches and um, the real concerns about uh, infringement of, of uh, state sovereignty, et cetera, that uh, inhibit the ability to monitor anything. 
I, I think the UN should really um, stay away from norm setting and uh, at risk of setting uh, norms that are too low um, and avoid global monitoring because uh, of, of what I just mentioned and really focus on the more technical uh, capacity building um, and, and convening uh, where the politics hopefully can be uh, kept out and it's just a space for uh, conversation, exchange of views without a um, sort of a, a, a imposing uh, a particular agenda or a particular um, a narrative uh, on the participants. Thank you, Eric. Uh, well, clearly, um, there's a lot of food for thought there. Uh, speakers, participants emphasizing both the considerable obstacles as well as the huge need for a coordinated, inclusive, multilateral response to violent extremism and, and terrorism. And while I can't promise you uh, it will contain all the answers. The Global Center's upcoming Blue Sky 5 report will hopefully continue this conversation as we will do uh, ourselves in meetings and, and discussions like this. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists and intervention providers. Thank you to the participants and the many questions that you've raised. Uh, and thank you to the Global Center team, in particular, Adele and Franzi, uh, for today's smooth running event. Uh, wishing all of you uh, the best of luck uh, during uh, the remainder of ONGA. Uh, stay safe, uh, take care, and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.